All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We are, we are going to get started. I meant to actually mention, if you don't have a copy of the notes, they're out there in the, in the foyer. You can get, grab a copy before we get started here as, as we're praying. But as I mentioned, we're going to finish uh, chapter, Zechariah chapter 1 this morning. And it's the, the vision of the four horns and the four carpenters. And it's a really interesting vision from the Lord that we're going to go through. It, it actually ties into most of the Bible and before we start, we should, let's always pray and petition the Holy Spirit to teach us everything here as we open up God's word. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. God, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint this place and that you would teach us everything. As we open your word, as we study to show ourselves approved and to not be ashamed at your coming, we pray that, Lord, you would gird us up. Bury your word deep into our heart at the front of our mind. God, let it be the meditation of our heart day and night, as David declared in Psalms. And we love you, we praise you for this time together, and we ask that you would be with us and speak to us, God. Let it be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so we've spent uh, two weeks on Zacharias so far. This is the third week, and we're going to finish chapter one. And, you know, as always, I always have to remind everybody, we want to make sure that we are leaning on the Holy Spirit to teach us everything out of God's word. And some of these things we're going to look at this morning are are kind of complex. Uh, They go in pretty deep. And so, as as usual, I just want to ask all of you, you know, do not take my word for it. Please go and search this out in the scriptures yourself. And, and prove that these things are so, just like Acts 17, 11. You've got to go search it out and prove that what we're studying here lines up with the entirety of, word, of the word of God. Okay, as a reminder, Zechariah, you have this Old Testament timeline starting from Adam and Eve and creation all the way to the end of the Old Testament. And this timeline's pretty good. It, it shows you the paradigms of history, the eras of history throughout the Old Testament, starting with creation, the call of Abraham, the period of the patriarchs, the wilderness wanderings, the conquest of the land as they entered Canaan, the conquest completed, the period of the judges, then you have the period of the kings, and then the Babylonian exile, and then post-exile, or after, after that 70-year captivity. Zechariah is a post-exile prophet. He was a contemporary of Haggai and Malachi, and then at the end of the Old Testament, it ends around 430 B.C., and a lot of scholars and people declare, okay, from that point to when Jesus shows up in Matthew or in the Gospels, the Bible is silent, and a lot of them call that the silent years, and in fact, they're not very silent at all. Daniel 11 prophesies them in advance with precision of the war and the struggle for power as Alexander the Great died and his four generals divided up the kingdom, and their struggle for those 400 years to take control of it before Rome conquered the earth. It's all prophesied in Daniel 11, so it's there. But we're studying Zechariah now. It's a post, he's a post-exile prophet. And Zechariah is widely considered the apocalypse of the Old Testament. And the apocalypse being just like the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The name Revelation in the Greek <clears throat> means apocalypsis. It literally means the unveiling of. And so when the Lord says, opening up the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, it literally is just the unveiling of who he is, who is Jesus. And that book is mirrored so much in Zechariah in the Old Testament. Now, the thing that I always find fascinating about this, and I, I just have to mention this every time, I think it's amazing how the world has such a negative connotation with the, world, the word apocalypse. I think that's fascinating that it literally just means the unveiling of who Jesus is, and yet the whole world is terrified of that event, of actually knowing who Jesus is. So in any case, all it means is the unveiling. He is the king of kings, and he will rule on this earth from the throne of David as promised to Mary when she was pregnant from Luke. But Zechariah is so rich, it's probably the most messianic book in the entire Old Testament. It's going to introduce Jesus cover to cover, The Lord will speak of the stone with seven eyes, which is a link to Revelation. He's going to speak of his throne, Jesus' throne. Jesus, the Nazarene, 
which is so interesting. You only find that one place in the Old Testament here. The king riding on a donkey, that's in Zechariah 9.9. The shepherd, his betrayal, and not only his betrayal by Judas, but for the amount of money and what they did with the money when he was betrayed. It's fascinating. Jesus being pierced or crucified, which wasn't even invented when this book was written by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, his return in power, destroying his enemies. And Zechariah 14, when he steps foot on the Mount of Olives, it splits by the word of his mouth, Armageddon, all of the enemies that surround Jerusalem are wiped out. And literally, the Lord, the Lord describes it as what you and I would know today as a neutron bomb. Because their eyes literally dissolve in their sockets and their tongues dissolve in their mouths, leaving only bones. So it, it, uh, by his word, he destroys his enemies in that regard. Zechariah's name means whom Yahweh remembers. Now keep in mind that the Israelites are in the exile in Babylon. And we went through this the first two weeks, but the, the timing difference between Haggai and Zechariah but it was critical at this critical moment when the children of Israel are about to go back and start rebuilding the temple that the Lord raised up a prophet whose name means whom Yahweh remembers. And he's sitting there telling them and encouraging God's people that God remembers you. You've been in this exile for 70 years, but he remembers you. He is the son of Berkiah, which means Yahweh blesses who in turn is the son of Edu, which means the appointed time. So from Zechariah's grandfather all the way down to him, the names of the genealogy literally mean in the appointed time Yahweh blesses whom Yahweh remembers. And so it's, a, it's, it's no surprise God raised up that family to minister to the Jews after they had been conquered by, and drug off to captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. God's servant, by the way. God appointed him to do that. Now remember... Just as a reminder, the Hebrews don't have a word for grandfather. So anytime you see Zechariah was the son of Edu, it literally means he was the grandson because if you have to go track down the genealogies. But it was a very important message to God's people. Okay, if you remember the outline here, we covered chapter 1, 1 through 6, a call to repentance. It was one of the, the strongest calls to repentance in the entire Old Testament to God's people. And then last time, before the baptism service, we covered uh, chapter 1, verse 7 through 17, the rider on the red horse. Now, if you weren't here, if you didn't have it, go back and listen to that message, but the, what was going on there, the rider under the myrtle trees on the red horse, is a, is a little sliver of time when Jesus returns in Revelation 19, conquers his enemies, his white horse is drenched and died by the blood of his enemies, and then he goes to rescue Israel from Isaiah 63 and brings them back to set up the kingdom. It's a, in, in my opinion, when you go back and you study it verse by verse, it's a snapshot of that little event right there. Okay, but today we're going to go down to the second vision that Zechariah has. Remember, he has all of these in one night. So some people classify them as eight visions, some as ten. You can go either way. I've listed them out as ten, just, but some people combine, for example, like two and three the two we're going to cover today, the four horns and the four carpenters. Some people combine that as one. It doesn't really matter. The point is he had all of these in one night, and, and the Holy Spirit wrote them through him in one night, which is pretty amazing. So we're going to cover the four horns and the four carpenters today, starting in verse 18 to close out chapter 1. Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Okay, now horns often speak of authority throughout the Bible. To lift up one's horn was a sign of victory. To lower one's horn was a sign of defeat. And the first place, what I love about this, is the first place in the Bible that horns appear is in Genesis 22. Now, there's a concept when you study the Bible that's kind of known as the law of first mention. <clears throat> so anywhere in the Bible that something's mentioned for the first time in a, in a location, it's significant. For example, go track down where the first time love shows up in the Bible. It has to do with this event, with Abraham's offering of Isaac. And it's the first time that love shows up in the Bible 
is where a father <clears throat> is commissioned to offer his son. Thus, the link to John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the first, the first place in that event is also where horns appear in the Bible. So if you think about horns meaning authority, look at this. In Genesis 22, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, let's look at this real quick. The offering of a son. In the Jewish culture, they call this the Akidah. So if you ever study this in Hebrew, that's what they call this event. In the Jews' history, it's very significant to the Hebrew culture of Abraham's offering of Isaac, especially to those that know Messiah, that know Jesus. So it starts in Genesis 22, verse 2. Then he said, this is the Lord speaking to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. That's the first place in the Bible that love appears, right there in Genesis 22, 2. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you, your only son. Now, if you remember the story, Abraham had more sons than Isaac at this point. He had Ishmael. And, but the Lord, from the Lord's perspective, Isaac was the son of promise, the only son that mattered. Because he, by Isaac, his lineage would lead to the Messiah. So in God's eyes, remember he told Abraham you would have seed and offspring, but he didn't believe him, so, or they, were, they got um, discouraged because it wasn't happening, right? And they were old in age. So Abraham and Sarai, they take her, her handmaiden, Hagar, and have Isaac, or uh, Ishmael, I should say. And it, was a, it turned out to be a cursing on the Jews, even though God blessed Ishmael. <clears throat> but Abraham had many sons, so by God's perspective, though, Isaac was the one. That, now look at this in verse 4 here, starting in verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw this place afar off. So from Abraham's perspective, Isaac was dead for three days. Because on the third day, they went on this journey, and the third day is when they got to Mount Moriah. It was a three days journey. In verse 5, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, isn't that fascinating in verse 5? Because God tells Abraham, go sacrifice your son Isaac on the top of this mountain that I will show you. It takes a three days journey. The people that are with him, he says, hey, all of you hang out down here on the mountain. My son and I will go up and worship. And both of us, he and I, will come back down to you. So Abraham had to know something. He had to know that, well, God promised that Isaac, through Isaac, the Messiah would come, but yet he's telling me to kill him, which means he has a problem. God has an issue that he has to resurrect Isaac because otherwise the, the promise wouldn't be fulfilled. So Abraham is walking in immense faith at this point and trusting God. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. So this whole thing is a picture of the father and Jesus going to the cross. But Isaac's carrying wood on his back, walking up the mountain, just like Jesus carrying the cross. And Abraham said, my son, remember uh, Isaac starts asking him, what, where's the sacrifice? And, remember, and then in verse 8, Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So even in that statement back to Isaac, Abraham is declaring prophecy of the Lord providing Jesus to be crucified for us. He will provide who? Himself as a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, if you look at this, they go from Salem or Jerusalem. That's what it was called before then. Remember Melchizedek, he was the king of Salem and he brought out, the king and priest of Salem, and he brought out uh, bread and wine <clears throat> with Abraham. So they journey north, and there's this ridge system that they went through to get all the way to the top of Mount Moriah. And the top of it, when you zoom in, it's at uh, 777 meters above sea level. It's the, where what we would know as Golgotha. It's where Jesus was crucified, just outside the gate north of Jerusalem. And that's where Abraham offered Isaac. 
But what's, what's fascinating when they get there, the, remember by whose authority took the place of Isaac, the horns. Remember his horns were caught in the ram, that sacrificial animal that did nothing wrong by the blood of an innocent, Isaac was replaced. And by his horns, he was caught. So the authority of Jesus took the place of Isaac on that altar. And that's just incredible. So horns, meaning authority. Remember the bronze altar had four horns and set in the court of the tabernacle. Now the bronze altar, it had these horns on it. And there's a lot of times throughout the Old Testament Remember that Aaron would take the blood of a sacrifice and put on the four horns of the altar, blood by blood and authority, you'll be cleansed. That that whole typology is there. But your sacrifice, look at Exodus 27 verse 2, and thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof, his horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Now brass throughout the Bible always speaks, it's the metal that could withstand fire, so it always speaks of judgment. That's why Moses fashioned a serpent on a pole with, a, with brass. That was the, the serpent being sin. Brass could withstand fire. He lifts it up. Obviously, it was the sin being judged to cleanse the people. That's the, the imagery there, which Jesus makes reference to finally in John 3 to Nicodemus. <clears throat> and you don't, it's amazing. You don't hear about that anywhere in the Old Testament. Why in the world did Moses use a serpent made of brass until you get to John 3 and then Jesus clarifies it for you? But, you know, your sacrifice today must be placed upon God's authority. No other authority is worthy of your sacrifice. And there's a a deep message here. Because in the world that we live in, it's very easy to give yourself over to something other than God. To be committed to fill in the blank, anything. Um, A career, you know, a, a home a personal relationship with somebody else, to find your security somewhere other than God. Wherever you put your heart and your sacrifice, which we are to be a living sacrifice, according to Romans 12.1, you're placing it on someone else's authority when you sacrifice time, treasure, money, talent, whatever, to make that sacrifice. So you want to make sure that your sacrifice is placed on God's authority. Okay, that's, that's the lesson for us today to be a living sacrifice, according to Romans 12, 1. You know, every sacrifice in the Old Testament was a dead one. Every one of them was killed, wrung out, laid on the altar. We as the church are the only ones called to be a living sacrifice. And it is hard to stay on that altar at times because it gets hot. You want to get down. You want to walk away. You want to retreat back to wherever you came out of. You know, the enemy wants to pull you back to the past desperately, get you back to where you're comfortable, pull you back to what God delivered you out of. And it's, it's at times, it is easy to just roll off of the, sacrif- the altar of God, right, and walk away. And as a living sacrifice, fortunately and unfortunately, you have the free will to do that. But God is saying, stay put. I'm the refining fire. Remember from Hebrews, our God is a consuming fire. And so he wants to burn away anything in your life that's hindering your relationship with him. But to do that, you have to be a living sacrifice that stays on the altar, on the authority of God, and lets him burn that away. The sooner you run away, the, it doesn't happen. Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got to stay there. You've got to be a living sacrifice. Now, the authority. Remember, the entire tabernacle speaks of Jesus. Now, When Moses went up on Mount Sinai for 40 days, he was given the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, and he was also given the architectural drawings and directions and specifications for what we call the tabernacle. Same thing. He came down with two things, the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle. And everything about the tabernacle speaks of Jesus. There's more written about the tabernacle than anything else in the Bible, any one individual object, which is amazing. And all of it, of course, points to Christ. And so when you look at the tabernacle, remember what Jesus said in, well, what the Holy Spirit said in John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word in the Greek means tabernacled. So the word, in the beginning was the word, 
it was made flesh, Jesus literally took on flesh of humanity and joined us in our predicament, and he dwelt and tabernacled amongst us. Now in Hebrews 9.24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, the true ark of the covenant, the true tabernacle, the true mercy seat, it's all in heaven. Moses was given a blueprint, a replica to make on the earth. Now, when you say the tabernacle, <clears throat> it had a court, of, uh, basically a wall around it. And on that wall, you had to go through one door to get in. Remember, Jesus said, I am the door. And the first place you came to was the bronze altar, the horns with the horns, the authority of God. And that's where you placed your sin offering, and that's all in Numbers 21. <clears throat> then you'd go to the bronze laver where you would have to wash. Remember what Jesus said, I am the living water in John? Then you would get into the holy place, and there were just a few things in there. There was a table of showbread, one loaf for each of the 12 tribes of Israel that would be changed out every Shabbat. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Then there was a, a candlestick, not the menorah, but a, well, kind of menorah, but not the Hanukkah one. That's a different one. <clears throat> the seven-branch candlestick, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then when you got through the veil, remember at the cross when the veil was ripped in two and torn down? So it was open house. Then you could get into the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. Okay, but you would get in and the, and the Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And the acacia wood is the same wood that was used as the burning bush that, that, the, that spoke to Moses and the crown of thorns that was placed on the head of Jesus, which really was probably a helmet, not just a crown, but there was a, a top to it, if you study that in the Greek, that when they pressed down, the thorns probably went in the top of his head as well. But then you have that. So Isaiah 53, 2, the outside of the tabernacle, it was covered in porpoise skins, goat skins, and ram skins that were bloody. It was gross. Nobody wanted to look at it. When you saw it, it had no comeliness, nor any, there was nothing about it that would give you desire to go into it. And that's from Isaiah 53, 2, that Jesus would, would fulfill that. His comeliness is no desire that you should want to go into it. <clears throat> but it was once you got inside that the relationship, it was magnificent. It was gold and the best scarlet and thread of anything that was made by man. It was amazing. You didn't realize the value of the relationship until you got inside of it. Now, in all of these, you can go through and just look at each of these and how it reflects Jesus. One of my favorites is when they would pack up the tabernacle and they would carry it on those wood poles. It had silver sockets. And so they would lift it up on those silver sockets to carry it around. And that silver always speaks of blood, Levitically, throughout the Old Testament. Remember, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. So throughout the Old Testament, silver always speaking of blood. It's by the blood of Jesus that his covenant and his dwelling with us was carried around with man all those years. So just amazing how the authority of those, all, those four horns, it's by his authority, then you get into the relationship. Okay, these, these horns, there have also been four Gentile kingdoms, or horns, four authorities, which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And Daniel prophesies about these four, these four horns, or four kingdoms, during the Babylonian captivity. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in Daniel 2, that nobody, none of the occultic, black magic practicing magicians in all of Babylon could interpret. No matter how hard they tried to call on the occult and the black magic they were practicing, they could not interpret the dream. But remember, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to tell him the dream and the interpretation, not just the interpretation. And there's only one person in all of Babylon that could do it, and he was walking by the spirit of the living God, and it was Daniel. Now, if you remember the dream in Daniel 2, 31 through 35, say, this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, telling him the dream. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, 
his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold going backwards, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so he tells him this dream. And remember the dream is five kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then Rome in two phases, and the final Antichrist kingdom, the beast system. The stone that's cut without hands is Jesus. Remember all through the Bible, he's the stone, the rock, and you can find that in 1 Corinthians the rock that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness was Christ. The stone that was cut without hands strikes the feet of the image, shatters the beast system that has roots all the way back to Babylon, and then that system becomes a mountain, a kingdom that fills the whole earth that shall never be shaken or put down. And that's when we return with Jesus in Revelation 19. Okay, and in, in Daniel 2, verse 44, now remember... Before we started Zechariah, when we were doing God's prophetic word, we studied a lot about these 10 kings and how the beast system that's being set up since 2020 is bleeding over into the church age right now. And you're seeing the setup for the first time in our lives, the setup of that system, the foundation being laid. And remember, do not let that draw you into fear of any kind. All it means is that Jesus is that much closer to taking us home. That's all it means. Because you will not be here when the Antichrist takes over. You are promised that over and over in the Bible. Okay, Jesus in Revelation 3 even says, I will save you from the very time of trouble. Literally meaning I will take you outside of time itself to where I am, to where I dwell, to where I inhabit eternity according to Isaiah. So he has a promise to do that and he's faithful. But in the days of these kings, so remember there's 10 kings the Antichrist rises out of them <clears throat> through war, puts three of them down. The other seven consolidate power to him, and then he affirms the covenant with Israel and starts the seven-year tribulation. So in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. I think God means that. This goes back to the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7. Remember when God said, I will, I will, your seed will sit on the throne forever. And that's speaking of Jesus through the line of David. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So just remember, this is a literal, physical kingdom from heaven to destroy the coming beast system. So we've got to stay true and run hard for Jesus right now. Now when you look, you can go out and Google and find uh, pictures of Daniel's metallic man anywhere on the internet. And all of them have a little slight differentiation between them on dates, but... This is the gist of it. You have gold, silver, brass, iron, and iron mixed with clay. The gold is the Babylonian kingdom. God tells you, tells you that in the book of Daniel. From about 606 B.C. to 538 B.C., when Daniel sees this same vision in Daniel 7, he sees them as terrible beasts, a winged lion, a bear on his side, a leopard, a terrible beast with ten heads, being the ten kings or the ten toes of the statue. Silver is Persia, or the bear on Daniel 7. Brass is Greece, the leopard. Remember, is the winged leopard. And Alexander the Great conquered the world so fast, faster than anyone else in the history of man. That's why God uses that imagery in Daniel 7. I think it was the age of 23 or 25, somewhere around there, that Alexander the Great cried himself to sleep weeping on his bed because he had no more land to conquer. It was that, he was that young and fast that he did it. Okay, then you have the iron, which is Rome. 
and that's the two legs. Remember, the western leg of the Roman Empire actually was defeated before the eastern leg, which is in modern-day Turkey. The eastern leg outlasted the western leg, but you have, that's why God picks up two legs in the statue there. The iron mixed with clay is the beast system. Now, and you can get, there's, there's a lot of speculation on why is it iron mixed with clay, because um, there's a lot, of, a lot in Daniel that talks about how they will try to cleave themselves to the seed of men, but they won't be able to. So it has a lot to do with something to do with genetic manipulation, because whatever it's trying to cleave is not the seed of men. It's trying to cleave to the seed of men. And you can see that just talked about all the time today. Think about Yuval Noah Harari and how he, he declares over and over and over that we are the last generation of true humans. That's what, that's, he, they state that at the World Economic Forum, that we are the last generation of true humans. Your children, there will never be humans after this. That's their goal, at least. Now, whether or not they succeed, uh, we know how it ends. They will not succeed because Jesus will not allow it. But that's their goal. And the other, statu- the other picture I've added in there on the right, I just liked it because it showed the stone cut without hands shattering the beast system and destroying all these satanic Luciferian uh, globalists that are trying to usher in this system. <laughs> but anyway, you can find all kinds of imagery out there for that, that prophetic dream. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar then twists the dream. Remember uh, in Daniel, he makes a statue that's all gold because he let pride set in and thought that his kingdom would last forever. And that's when he declares, okay, all of you, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, bow down to me or else I will throw you in the fire. Remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah do not bow down. And <clears throat> then you have the whole fiery furnace scene with where Jesus meets them. Okay, the four horns. The number four, it is so prevalent in the book of Zechariah. There's four horses, four horns, four craftsmen, four chariots, four winds, four subordinate clauses in chapter three, four words of comfort, four persons, four feast days, four admonitions. There's fourfold guilt in chapter seven, four pronouncements in chapter eight, fourfold punishment in chapter eight, four cities, four verbs. There's even groupings of four things in chapter 10. There's four lamentations. There's four animals in chapter 14. If you classify it as eight visions instead of 10, it's four times two. There's eight visions. So the number four just shows up everywhere. Now notice, so these four horns, you had, when we looked at Nebuchadnezzar's dream, there were five kingdoms, right? Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome in two phases, or the the beast system. But notice what God says, the four horns are those that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Of the five kingdoms, only four of them scatter Israel. It's from Babylon to Rome. The beast system, the fifth one, doesn't scatter Israel. It tries to wipe out Israel. So that's the difference. That's why God makes that declaration here. Okay, these four kingdoms. Now, God says something really interesting here that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. It's a complete collection of the 14 tribes of Israel. Now, you're probably saying, what do you mean 14 tribes? I thought Jacob had 12 sons. Well, there's 12 tribes, but remember, Joseph has two sons who Jacob adopts in in, uh, Exodus during the Egyptian Exodus event before that happens. So Manasseh and Ephraim become sons to Jacob. And so God then from their po- that point forward has 14 names to choose from in the Bible. And he always leaves two out for whatever reason, whenever he makes a list. But I just had to share this with you. There's also a myth out there. I, I don't know how prevalent it is today. Back 20 years ago, you'd hear it a lot. But there's a myth out there that some believe that the northern tribes, when they were wiped out by Assyria that there were 10 of them, 10 of those tribes that got totally destroyed and wiped off the the face of the earth. They call it the lost 10 tribes. And it all happened after the death of Solomon. So just so you're aware of of that that's out there, and here's biblically why it's not accurate. The myth of the 10 lost tribes is where a lot of people get into talking about uh, British Israelism or Europe was what the Jews migrated and founded all of Europe, and that's what happened to some of the ten tribes and things like that. That's not true. In Acts 26, the Holy Spirit makes reference to the 12 tribes. In Acts 26, verse 6, 
and now I stand in him judged for, this, for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes. So in Acts, see the Lord's referencing the 12 tribes. They weren't lost. During the Civil War, there was a split. The Israelites who were into idolatry went north. The Israelites who wanted to worship Yahweh stayed in the south and worshiped in the temple. And so they stayed there. And that's where this kind of myth comes from. But those that wanted to worship Yahweh truly stayed in the south with, uh, in Judah. They didn't go up north to the northern kingdom. <clears throat> Jesus spoke about all 12 tribes in Matthew 19, verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, that's in the millennium, ye also shall sit upon the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so the 12 tribes are there in the millennium, and people are going to sit and judge them. James opens to the 12 tribes. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, it's interesting, the book of James, actually, that name in the Hebrew means Jacob. So you have a book named after Jacob. It's Yaakov. And so you have a, a book to Israel, to all 12 tribes, or the composite of Israel in the New Testament. I think that's awesome. So it's, it's a great book. Okay, the 12 tribes are sealed during the tribulation. Remember, there's 14 names available, but you see this. There's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes during the tribulation. That's all in Revelation 7, 4 through 8. And if you remember when we studied that, the tribe of Dan is not sealed because he, by him, he allowed idolatry to re-enter the land. Remember the golden calf, when they refashioned the golden calves after the Civil War, one was put up in the north in Dan, and so by him he allowed that. He's not sealed in the tribulation, <clears throat> but his tribe does inherit the land in the millennium, according to Ezekiel, which is awesome. The point of all of that is that God knows where his chosen people are at all times. He knew where they were during the days of the Civil War in Israel. He knows where they are today. And he will know where they are during the tribulation to fulfill his promise that goes all the way back to Abraham. God, God isn't sitting there going, well, gosh, I've got to seal 12,000 out of the tribe of Simeon. Where are they today? No, he knows. He knows who his people are. And he will know where they are. And I want you to be encouraged that he knows where you are in your life. God, you are not lost to God. You are not roaming around trying to figure out, you know, on your own, Lord, what am I to do with my life? Because he has a call on your life. He has a, an anointing for you and your family and something that he wants to fulfill in your life. And he knows that. And so just keep that in mind. He always knows where you are. And now, in doing so, uh, he also promises to bless you today if you will bless Israel. It's one of the reasons why you should pray for Israel. You should support missions that are messianic, messianic Jews that are speaking to Jews in synagogues and going on spreading the word to them to save the, his people. Uh, that's all from Genesis 12. I put that at the bottom there, Genesis 12, verse 3. Okay, moving on. So in verse 21, to close out chapter 1 here, then said I, what, okay, in verse 20, I'm sorry, and when the Lord showed me four carpenters, now look what Zechariah asks. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. And these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Now, anytime you see a Gentile power try to lift up their authority over the land of Israel, it never goes well for them, ever. All the way back from the dawn of creation, it never goes well. <clears throat> the same is true today. But Zechariah sees four smiths or carpenters now that have fought back to scatter these four Gentile kingdoms. Notice that he didn't ask who they are. He just asked about their function. What, what are these carpenters here to do? Now, one of the ironies here is that when the beast system is in place and the Antichrist is ruling the earth, that kingdom will be destroyed by a carpenter. Isn't that amazing? 
And, and Zechariah sees here in verse 21 these four carpenters that destroy the four Gentile powers that have tried to scatter Israel, going all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. You know, it's amazing how the entire universe <clears throat> and the future of every person to ever live was paid for by, by the blood of a carpenter hanging on a wooden cross in Judea that he made the very tree that it was made from. The entire universe is judged on that event. Every kingdom that is, up, is taken up and put down is judged by him and him alone. He raises kings and puts them down. And you and I have the same thing. So what I want to encourage all of you in, you know, <clears throat> we're going to open up chapter 2 next Sunday and continue this study, but you are seeing the setup of something that the entire Bible has spoken about from the beginning. The setup of a beast system, and the church will not get caught up into it, despite Satan trying to move and accelerate timelines and trying to get the church captured into it. We will not. We will not be here when that system is put into place. <clears throat> and you're going to be taken out with a trumpet, the sound of a trumpet from 1 Thessalonians 4, <clears throat> and raptured out of here. And at that point, the only thing that is going to matter is what you did for Jesus while you were here. That's the only thing that's going to matter. Nothing else will matter. Remember from 1 Corinthians at the Bema seat, everything you do in your life will be wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones. And it will be tested by fire, and that fire is Jesus. And it will burn away everything that was of the flesh, the wood, hay, stubble, and what is left, the gold, silver, precious stones, you're going to walk into an inheritance that the Lord has laid up for you from the foundation of the earth. And the question is, are you faithful now to have it all and to walk in and lay it then at the feet of Jesus from Revelation 4 and 5? Remember, we looked at this last time with Luke 19 because in Zechariah 1 verse 17, God declares he will have his cities, plural. All through the Bible... There's been one city that's a city of God, and that's Jerusalem. Now, I find that fascinating because as the church in the millennium, he's going to have cities all over the earth. And that's what he declares in Luke 19. It's kind of, it's kind of a slight variation of the parable of the talents. But remember what Jesus says when he says to the one that's faithful, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities, and then over five cities in Luke 19, verse 19. And then the one that wasn't faithful, his authority was taken and given to somebody else. The authority he would have walked in in the millennium. So I just want to encourage you that we are to take our call very serious. And take it without hesitation. When God told Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac, he didn't wait. Now when he called him originally, he did wait. Abraham waited. And he went with his dad to Ur of the Chaldeans, or I'm sorry, from Ur of the Chaldeans until his dad died. Then he followed his call. And he, he paid for it a little bit after that. He should have done that. He should have listened to God and gone immediately out to what he was calling him to. And he learned that lesson so that when God called him to sacrifice Isaac, he went. He woke up the next morning without hesitation and he went. And so if you are sitting here or listening to this today <clears throat> and you are wondering and you're thinking, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I just want to encourage you to go and get in the quiet place and alone with the Lord and ask him, what, Lord, what is it that you would have of my life? What is it that you would have me walk out and do today? He knows it and he wants you to know it. And so don't let confusion set in because God's not the author of confusion. You should not be confused about your call. <clears throat> and if you are, you need to pray against that and pray to the Lord that, just like in the book of Jude, when Michael is battling Satan over the body of Moses, the Lord rebuke you because the Lord is the one that needs to rebuke the enemy on your behalf and get alone with you to share that with you. And... You may not hear in hour one or hour two, but as you study his word and as you draw closer to him, you're going to feel it and see it 
and God will begin to speak to you very privately on what he wants you to do. And take that serious because what he has equipped and prepared you for is different than anyone else in your life. It's unique. It's unique to you. It's unique to what, how he fashioned you, the gifts and the talents that he placed in you, and what he wants to do in your life. <clears throat> now, in order to do that, sorry, my allergies are really bad. To get to that point, <clears throat> you have to be born again, right? That's step one. And then you get on the sanctification process. So if you're here, if you're, not if you're not saved, or if you're listening to this later, anything, and you need to get saved, <clears throat> it's very simple. Romans 10, 9, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Do not hesitate. Get born again right now. And do not wait for it, because you are not promised another second on the earth. And so if you need to get saved, get saved today. Be born again in the Spirit, never to be unborn, and walk with God for the rest of your life. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much. God, we love you. We thank you for this time together, God. We thank you for what you showed Zacharias so long ago, that we have much to learn about it today. The four Gentile kingdoms that sought to scatter your people Israel, and God, the fifth one that will be put down and destroyed. <coughs> Lord, we love you. We pray that, God, you would be with us as we leave this place. God, I ask that you would anoint every single person listening to this, and that's a part of this church and this fellowship, those that are out traveling. God, those that watch all over the world, those listening to this later. God, I pray that you would anoint them and equip them for their call. God, let them take it serious. Let them dedicate their lives to you as you continue to foster, strengthen, and grow an unashamed bride looking for the return of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for that promise, God. Be with us this morning and be with us in the week ahead. God, we love you so much and we praise your name, Lord, in your mighty, matchless name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.